Well, hey everyone, and welcome to Young Adults. Whether you're watching online or you're at one of our campuses, maybe you're at Coral Gables downtown, Doral, West Kendall, or Palmetto Bay, we are so glad that you're joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. My name is Gabriel, and I get to serve as a young adult pastor here at Christ Fellowship. And you're joining us for a great time. Why? Because last week we started a brand new series that we titled Defining Moments. That's right. We're looking at life changing scenes in the life of King David. And Pastor Tucker online, he did a great job kicking off this uh, series. And so we're going to continue and pick up the narrative in 1 Samuel chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up there. If you're one of our campuses and you're not already, I'm going to ask you that you stand up to your feet as we read God's word. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 45. And the word of God reads like this. It said, then David said to the Philistine, Goliath, he said, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Today, I, I really believe it's going to be a powerful word, and I believe that it's going to change us, but we need God's help to do it. So let's go to him in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, that we can be watching this um, online or at one of our campuses. And Father, we are grateful that we get to freely open up your scriptures and Lord, learn more about you and Father, what you're about. And Lord, we know that you want to meet us right now where we're at. And so Father, right now in this moment, I pray for anyone listening or watching that we would rest our hearts, that if they're a little restless, our minds, that we would just put them at ease, that we would remove any distraction that you would open up our spiritual ears and eyes to see and hear where you're at work. Lord, we love you. And Father, um, we know that there are some giants in our lives, Lord, that we, we need to overcome. And Father, I pray that today after your word is preached and the gospel is proclaimed, that Lord, that we would walk out from this place or listening from this sermon, doing just that overcoming giants in our life. We love you, God, and we come before you as your church, as your people. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, and the church said, amen and amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Well, guys, yesterday, August 7th, uh, your boy turned 33 years old. That's right. Yesterday was my birthday. I'm getting a little bit older. Uh, praise God. Hopefully more wisdom, but not more wrinkles, right? Uh, but my wife, I love my wife. She always likes to go above and beyond and celebrate my birthday, even though I'm like, I'm super chill. I don't really, like, I'm just like, hey, man, let's just... Let's just do nothing, like just eat steak, that's it, you know? But my wife likes to go above and beyond, and um, one of the surprise gifts that she gave me, she's like, hey, we're gonna do something fun. I know that you like to go on adventures, and so she said, hey, dress for an adventure. You know, that means like short and a t-shirt and sneakers, right? Get in the car, she punches in an address, and so she says, drive. And so we start driving, and, and we're headed, and I'm looking like, okay, we're headed to the beach, and I'm like, I wonder what we're going to do. I'm trying to, like, decipher what this surprise is, and I can't until we finally pull up to some of you may know uh, as Parrot Jungle, and now it's Jungle Island. And as we're pulling up, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm like, ain't no 33-year-old want to go see, like, birds on his birthday. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to go see birds on my birthday. I don't even like birds that much, Right. But I didn't know that in, in Jungle Island, they have this thing called treetop trekking, right? It's, it's this amazing obstacle course. Um, you can see pictures right here where you are just up high in the canopy of these trees and you're going through these obstacles, you're zip lining. Guys, I had a blast. And let me tell you, my wife, she did all of it. She is a beast. I, my bride, man, she, she's a gangster, true G. But it was amazing. And, and we did all these four levels. It starts with beginner, intermediate, advanced, and then like the crazy one. And my wife knows I'm crazy, so I wanted to do all of them. And uh, the thing is that we had a great time, but we didn't, we didn't realize that the experience would take us this long. 
And it wasn't because it was hot, even though it was, and it wasn't because it was hard, but the reason why the experience took us way longer than what we expected was because when you're going through this course, you're going with people in front of you and behind you. It's not just you by yourself, unless you know somebody's way ahead of you or way behind you, but you're going in the middle of a pack. And sure enough, my wife, we get started, and, and it, the way that it works is there's this platform, and only two people can be on a platform at a time. And so one person would go through the obstacle, and then uh, when one, the one platform is empty with one person, a next one would come, and, and you would move through this whole obstacle course that way. And right in front of us, guys, <laughs> there's this couple, God bless them, <laughs> but they were terrified. They were terrified. The girlfriend, she was ahead of the boyfriend and she was like, just, she was shaking. She was so terrified. But let me tell you, even though she was scared, she was brave and she started to go through the obstacles and started doing them. And people were like cheering her on because you could tell that she was afraid. And then it's the boyfriend's turn. If she was terrified, he was petrified. I mean, my dude was just like, he was just shaking, knees quivering. He would not, he could not do it. He was just stuck at every single obstacle. He did not want to go forward. And sure enough, I ended up learning his name because his girlfriend kept calling Dre, Dre, Dre. And so uh, there was a one point where like we're there and we're waiting and literally this whole first level beginner course should have only taken about 15 to 20 minutes to complete. And we were at each obstacle for over 15, 20 minutes. So much so that at one of the obstacles, we were there for 40 minutes. I'm talking about this should take you about like, a minute or two to like complete, we were there for 40 minutes because my dude would not move. He was terrified. He would look at this obstacle and try to grab the ropes and this guy was so scared that fear had paralyzed him. He could not move another inch forward. And there I was trying to, you know, try to be an encourager. I'm like, you got this, bro. And try to try to put your foot here. And I'm trying to encourage him from a distance. You got this because, again, we cannot pass them and we cannot go back because that's how the system is built, right? It's for our safety. And so everyone on this course, we're stuck. We're waiting for him. But Dre was paralyzed by fear. He would look at this obstacle and he couldn't go forward. He's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. He would try. And this fear paralyzed him so much that it rid him of reason. He couldn't even reason right. You would tell him to move his right hand or left hand and he would move his feet and he would just like, his body was contorting. I mean, he was literally paralyzed by fear. You know, as I started to prepare this message and think about Dre and think about his fear, the truth is that all of us in our lives, we will also go through these moments of fear in our life where it will leave us paralyzed. Maybe your fear is not an obstacle course. Maybe your fear is something with your health. Maybe your fear is when you take a test. Maybe your fear is you are fearful of the uncertainty of your future. But we all go through these moments of, of great fear in our life. But what I want to encourage someone today, that as children of God, these giants of fear will, will come throughout our lives. Listen, we are not promised as children of God that we won't go through problems, that we won't be fearful. No, we are promised that we're gonna go through some things. But as children of God, what we are promised is that God is with us that we are more than conquerors in Jesus' name. Who says amen to that? And so what I want to encourage you today is that as children of God, we are called to overcome giants. Matter of fact, if you're taking notes today, I've titled today's message, Overcoming Giants. Can you say overcoming? Yeah, turn to your name and say, we got to overcome some giants today. And so I, I hope that you guys are taking some notes wherever you find yourself listening or watching this message today. I want to encourage us as people of God to overcome the giants of our life. So the question is, right, what do these giants look like? What do they do to us? And the true question is, how do we overcome these giants? Well, we're going to find out those questions as we look at the giant in David's life in this story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And so if you're taking notes down, write this down. What is the giant that we see? We see the giant Goliath. The giant that we see in David's life is the giant Goliath. Let's go back to the scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse four. It says this, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath 
whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was about 5,000 shekels of bronze. I'm gonna break all this down in a second. You're like, what are those measurements? I'm gonna break it down, I promise. Verse six, it says, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. And so I know that you're like, what does this mean? Let me break it down. Scholars believe that Goliath, right? We see that he was six cubits in a span. Scholars believe that Goliath was anywhere from seven, uh, seven feet, two inches to nine feet, six inches. I mean, this guy was a giant. Regardless if he was on the lower scale or on the top of that scale, this dude was massive, massive. Now, I know that in today's day, we may think of that. It's like, yeah, he was, he was kind of freakishly tall, but there's nothing to be scared of. Well, let me give you some more perspective. Not only was this guy anywhere from seven feet to nine feet, six inches, but this, listen, the, the majority, the average Israelite in that time was about five feet, three inches. You guys tracking with me? It's like LeBron James and Danny DeVito. You, you feel me? Like that is the extreme. It wasn't that he was just giant, but the average Israelite was about five feet, three inches. I'm about five, nine on a good day. Defending on my shoes, 5'10", you know? Um, um, but the average person was about 5'3". And so looking at a seven foot person or a nine foot person, I mean, that is intimidating already. But it said not only was this guy super tall, but he was massive. It says that his armor weighed over 125 pounds. Some of our young adults don't even weigh that much, right? You need to eat some more churrasco in your life, right? But could you imagine carrying 125 pounds of armor? This is how massive this guy was. And it said that his spear, the head of his spear, it was over 15 pounds. That's pretty much a sledgehammer with a point on it. That was his spear. So this dude, he was massive. Physically massive. He was gigantic. But not only that, look at what it says in verse 8 as we continue the story. You guys with me so far? Yeah? Stay with me. Look at what it says. It says in verse eight, chapter 17, he says, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to drop for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Verse 10, and the Philistine said, this is key, I defy the ranks of Israel of this day, on this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And then verse 11, look at the response. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. What does it say? That's right. And greatly afraid. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see, if you're taking notes, write this down as letter A. Giants can produce great fear. Giants can produce great fear. Here is this towering man. He is massive. And what scripture says is that they were finding themselves in this valley. And on one side of the hill of the valley were the Philistines. And on the other side of the valley of this hill were the Israelites. And he, they were hearing and seeing this man from a distance. And he was massive, so massive that he also defies the army of God. And when the people heard this, when the king and all the Israelites heard this, it says that they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see, Goliath, he produced fear and anxiety in the life of the Israelites. He even paralyzed the Israelites. And what is this about fear? Because the truth is that we all go through fear or have fears in different stages of our life, right? My son in a couple days, God, I, I love him so much, Lucas. He's gonna be five years old. And right now, one of the things that Lucas is afraid of is what? What are little kids afraid of? That's right, the dark. Lucas is scared of the dark, and rightfully so. When I was his age and even older on, I, I, I'm in church. I know I, I can, this is a safe place to admit things, right? I was terrified of the dark. 
I would literally, we lived in a two-story house, and I remember when I needed to go, like, drink water, uh, I would literally, like, announce myself as I was going down. It was, like, 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, I'm going to the kitchen to try to scare whatever, like, if there was anything in there. Like, that was me. I was terrified of the dark. That was a fear that I had. And, and it, honestly, it messed with me. I would see things in the dark that weren't really there. Like, fear does a big thing to you. But later on, when you're teen, right, maybe there's a fear of not fitting in. Maybe there's a fear of like taking a test and, and bombing this class. Maybe when you're a young adult, we're very uh, fearful of an uncertain future. Everyone is hooking up and they're in relationships like, what about me? And, we, and it, fear starts to paralyze right there where we're at. Maybe it's a career decision and we're scared to make the wrong decision. And as adults, can I tell you, as an adult, we're, we're not immune to fear either. As adult, we start to get fearful over financial situations. We start to get fearful over health issues. You know, as a church, you know that we've been, we were praying for Pastor Rick and doing all these things, and there's been so many things that have gone on, and people have been just, just kind of sharing their, their fear because fear is, 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 is a real thing. One of the most paralyzing of all human emotions is fear. It's an emotion that, guys, when we go through it and when these giants, we're face-to-face -face with these giants, we are paralyzed by fear. And one of the things that fear does, it, it can rob us of reason, just like it did Dre, and he was so scared of this obstacle course, he didn't know what was his right hand, his left hand. He was just stuck. It robbed him of his reason. But also for us as believers, it can rob us of our faith. When we are faced with obstacles, it can, it, it can be so intimidating, so overwhelming that these giants, they produce fear in our lives and they leave us paralyzed, but they rob us of our reasoning and they also, it can rob us of our faith. So my question for us, at whatever campus you're watching this, or if you're watching this online or listening to this, let me ask you a question today. What is the giant in your life? What is the Goliath? right now? What is this big obstacle that is producing fear and it's leaving you paralyzed? What is the giant in your life right now in this season? Because let me remind you, Scripture does not promise us, the Word of God does not promise us that we won't go through fear, that we're not going to go through obstacles or difficult things. No, on the contrary, it says we're going to go through some things. Matter of fact, James tells us that we need to consider pure joy when we're going through things. Why? Because when we go through those things, it's doing something to our character. It is building us up. And so if we are not promised to not go through difficult things, if we're promised to go through things, let me ask you, what is the giant right now in your life? Or maybe what is the giant that right now just left you in, in shambles and left you with scars and, and then when you think about it, it kind of like raises the, 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 the hair on your arms. Like what is the giant in your life? Or young adult, let me tell you, there is a giant coming to your life. What is that giant? Because as children of God, we have a response we're supposed to respond a specific way when we are faced with these obstacles, with these giants in our life. You know, in this book that I hold right here in my hand, in the copy of the Word of God, you know that the Bible tells us over 63 times to fear not? It says, fear not, fear not. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. We are promised we're gonna go through some things. There's gonna be some giants in our lives, but Scripture tells us, Fear not. Why? Because God is with me. Because God is with you, child of God. Why do I say, and why do other preachers also say child of God? Because it's probably the most beautiful thing that you could ever be called in your life. Not a husband, not a wife, not a father, not a mother, not like the best employee. The most beautiful thing that someone could ever call you is a child of God. You're God's kid. And if you are God's kid, God is going to protect you and God has you in his hands. You know, one of the things for me 
uh, being a dad, and I ain't gonna lie to you, I, I'm extremely protective of my kids. I, I've shared a story from this platform that I even like hip bumped, hip checked another kid because he was about to be mean to mine. Like if you go back and, and see one of my latest messages, it, it was about that. But the truth is, is that I love my kids and I, I don't want um, harm to come their way. And I know that harm is gonna come their way. And, and, and I, as a dad, I wanna be there to protect them, to make sure that they're okay. And I have this like very big desire in me to, to make sure that my kids are safe. And can I tell you, I am a broken, moral, sinful man. And if that's the desire that I have for my kids, could you imagine the perfect, holy desire that God Almighty has for you as his kid? There may be some giants in your life right now, this very moment. It may be a health thing. It may be a mental thing, a spiritual thing, a physical thing. But can I tell you, that giant is no match for God. Can we make some noise for Jesus in this place right now? Wherever you find yourself, you can clap it up for God. Listen, there is no giant that is a match for God. We are more than conquerors in Jesus. We have not been given a spirit of timidity or of fear, but one of power, and it's all because of God. We are God's kid. And scripture tells us repeatedly to fear not. But here is the Israelite army, and here is King Saul, and they are shaking in their boots, and they are extremely afraid. So what happens next in the story? Well, we see the overcomer the one that's over, gonna overcome the giant. Matter of fact, write this down as number two. We see the overcomer whose name is who? Is David. Look at what the story says. I'm gonna read verse 12 and also skip to 14. It says, verse 12, now David was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. My gosh, could you imagine wrestling with eight dudes and, and just like punching and fighting? Like, wow, and he is the baby. So you know he got it the worst, right? Now, verse 14 says, David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So slip into the scene because David, we see and scholars believe that he's anywhere from 13 years old to 15 years old. He's a kid, he's a teenager, right? Th put it this way, he's in middle school, has to be in middle school, all right? Not only is he in middle school, but he has, he has seven older brothers, he is a jit, he's a baby, and his job, he's a shepherd boy. His job is to feed the sheep and tend to the sheep. That's what he's doing. And his brothers are there with the Israelites and they're hearing the taunting of this guy and they're hearing and seeing this gigantic man and they're shaking. And so what David was doing is that he would tend to the sheep and then he would bring his brother's food because that's what his dad told him to do. So he's a little kid, he's tiny, he's, he's young, he's a teenager. But what happens to David? Look at what it says again in the story later on in verse 16, and then we'll skip to 22. It says, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Stop right there. This was going on for 40 days. Really quick, I, this wasn't even like, I didn't even think about this in my notes until now. That is too long to be shaken in your boots. Can I tell you, whatever feeling you might be feeling, whatever thing that you might be going through your life, listen, it's okay to go through things, but let me tell you, as one of your pastors, one of your friends, someone that loves you, it's not okay to stay there. Let, let me say it one more time. It's okay to go through things, and it's okay to experience these things, but it's not okay to stay there. Why? Because you need to start living in the promises of God. You need to be reminded that you are under the umbrella of God. So for 40 days, this guy was taunting in them. They were terrified. They were greatly afraid. And verse 22 says, And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, and he ran to the ranks and went ahead and greeted his brothers. He's, he's coming back. He left the sheep behind. Verse 23, And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, right, the Philistine of, of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines, and spoke the same words as before. Stop right there. He, he, he went back up and day after day and night after night, he was going up. He said, come on, who's going to fight me? Come on, chick. Like, think of like trash talking, but everybody is down. Like they're, they're peeing their pants. They're just terrified. And then it says, I love to stay with me. And David heard him. And David heard him. Verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, 
who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me read that one more time. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You wanna know something why David was the overcomer? And if you know this story, listen, I'm a spoiler alert. David actually defeats Goliath. He grabs a sling and he smet with, with these pebbles from a creek and he hits him with one just right in the middle of a forehead, knocks him down. And then with his own sword, grabs Goliath's sword and cuts his head off. And that's how the story ends. It's amazing. David, David defeats Goliath. Well, bro, I thought that was your sermon. No, we, most of us have heard this story. That's not what this is about. You see, the reason why David, even before he hit him with the sling, with the, with the slingshot, even before he cut his head off, he had already won. Do you know why? Because write this down as letter A, because David shifted his perspective. You need to shift your perspective. Look at what he says again in verse 26. It says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, listen, one of the things that you have to understand, why is David saying this? Why is it important? Because one of the things that we see about God in Scripture is that God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. You guys tracking with me? God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. He makes a covenant with Abraham, a covenant with Isaac, a covenant with Jacob. Fast forward to even the New Testament. New Testament means new covenant. We are living under the new covenant, the new blood of Jesus Christ. We, as people of God, Followers of Jesus are in a new covenant with God. And can I remind somebody? God not only is a covenant-making God, he's a covenant-keeping God. Can I get an amen in one of our campuses? Or somebody in the room? Somebody in the room? Amen, right? I think I heard an amen, a silent one in there, right? He is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. Why is this so important? Because in order to be under God's covenant, what the people of Israel would do is that the God, they, they would get circumcised and that means that they would be under this covenant. Now I know like you're hearing about this like, Gabe, whoa, listen, hey, we live under new grace, so whether you are here or not, don't worry about that. That's a conversation for another day. But we're young adults, we're mature, we're gonna push through it, right? Stay with me because this is amazing. You see, what David as a 13-year-old boy remembers, not only realizes, but remembers, is that he's under the covenant of God. He's in the covenant and he's under the covenant. And so when he says, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Who, is, who does this guy think he is? He's defying the armies of the living God. What David is saying, his perspective is that, who does this guy think he is? David does not see a giant. David does not see this math, massive guy. David sees a guy that is not under the covenant of God. David understands that he is a child of God, that he is under the covenant of God, that he is right there and that he is in God's hand when this guy, he is an enemy of God. You see, if you're going to start overcoming giants in your life, you need to shift your perspective. If you're gonna start overcoming some giants in your life, you gotta shift your perspective. And that's why he says, who does this guy think he is? And why is this covenant thing so important? Because listen, to us uh, right now in our days in 2023, for those that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, listen, we have salvation. We are in that covenant with God. Can I get an amen? Let me paint it an example this way. When you receive salvation, let me, let me just like kind of paint it this way. This umbrella represents salvation in your life. And there's nothing that you could do that would remove salvation or re take away that salvation from your life. But here is what this whole covenant thing makes sense. It's like, Picture that if I were to go outside with this umbrella and it was raining, but if I just kept it in my hand, I didn't open, if I was not under that umbrella, there's really like, I'm not really just operating in that salvation, if that makes sense. And that is the same thing. Listen, not only do we need salvation, but we need to be able to operate within the giftings and the benefits of our salvation as children of God. And that's why David is saying, who is this uncircumcised? Who's this guy that is not even saved, that is not a child of God? I am a child of God. He's an enemy of God. He has shifted his perspective and he knows before he even flung that slingshot, before he even cut his head off, listen, that guy's already a dead man walking. What I want to encourage you today with my umbrella, if I can do it right, 
What I want to encourage you today is, listen, for you to understand that you have been saved by grace through faith, that if you received Christ, you are saved and there's nothing that can remove you from the hands of God. But not only should you understand that you're saved, but you need to walk in that covenant understanding that when you look at the obstacles, the giants of life, you can say, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, that ain't nothing about that. Why? Because I am more than a conqueror in Jesus. That listen, if God is for me, who can be against me? This is good news to someone today. If God is for me, who can be against me? Many of you today, you are faced with giants or you will be faced with giants. And before you attack it physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you need to shift your perspective. If I can be honest with you, one of the fears in my life has been a spiritual one. Most of you know that I grew up in the faith. I grew up in a Christian home with mom and dad, both loving God. But because I grew up in a spiritual and Christian home, I I always wondered, am I really saved? And can I tell you, that question has paralyzed me time after time after time in my 33 years of life. And it has paralyzed me. It has rid me of reason sometimes, and it has even, even rid me of my faith. It has made me forget or put God's promises in the back of my brain, in the back, in the bottom of my heart. And can I remind you, we need to overcome giants. And how are we going to do that? It's by shifting our perspective, by reminding our hearts, our souls, our minds that we are children of God, that we are in that covenant, and that we need to walk under that covenant as well. So much so that let me end with this. Look at what Samuel says In verse 45, it was our passage for today. I'm gonna end with this. It says, then David said to the Philistine, he's face to face, this 13 year old Danny DeVito, (laughs) but he's 13 years old. He's, He's walking up to this LeBron James massive guy. And he says, you come to me with a sword and with a spirit and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and I will cut your head off. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is not yours, young adult. For the battle is not your parents. It's not your financial situation. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. You see, even before David swung that slingshot, even before David cut off his head, he had already defeated Goliath in his heart and his mind. Why? Because he realized that he needed to shift his perspective from this giant, and to overcome this giant, he needed to remind himself that he is a child of God, that if God is for him, who can be against him? And there are some young adults in this room today that that's my prayer for you, that as you face giants or as you're facing as giants or as you will face a giant, how will you overcome? By shifting your perspective, by understanding that you are in the palm of the almighty God. And if God is for you, who can be against you? I pray that this word encourages you and blesses you today. And maybe today, your first step is understanding, is, is, is maybe coming to the conclusion, you know what, Gabe, like, I, that, that's amazing to know that, but I'm, I'm not in that covenant. I have not received, I'm not confessed with my heart and with my mind, with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's the first step that you need to take. Matter of fact, at all of our campus, I wanna encourage us to right there where you're at, bow your heads and close your eyes. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, God, and we're just so grateful for this time. We're so grateful for this story that, yes, many of us have heard time and time again, or maybe someone for the first time is hearing it for the first time. Lord, I pray that no matter where we are in our spiritual journey, that we would understand that the way that we can overcome these giants is by shifting our perspective, by understanding that, God, that you are with us. 
As scripture says over 63 times that we're called to fear not, to not fear evil, to not fear these giants in our life. Why? Because Lord, you are with us. Because you have gone before us. Because the greatest obstacle in our life, Jesus, you already defeated on the cross of Calvary by dying for our sins and being raised on the third day. That is the greatest giant that we could ever face. And Jesus, you already defeated it and you said it is done, it is finished. But Lord, I do pray for those that are facing giants today that they would be able to shift their perspective and know that they are children of God and that they can walk in that covenant promise keeping God's hands. And Lord, I pray for those that maybe they haven't made that decision. I pray that they would make it today, that they would understand and recognize that they are sinners, that they are broken and that they need a savior. And that Lord, there's nothing that they could do. There's not money, it's not a membership. Lord, it's not coming to church. It's only by putting their faith or trust or hope in Jesus and Jesus alone. And so right there where you're at any of our campuses, if you haven't done that, I wanna encourage you to do that today. Put your faith, put your hope, put your trust in Jesus. You could say something like this. Look, it's not the prayer, it's not this poem or words that save you, it is the confession of your heart. You can say, God, thank you. Thank you for showing me that I am a sinner. And thank you for showing me that there is a big giant in my life, and that giant is called sin. But Lord, I thank you for sending Jesus to defeat that giant named sin by defeating it on the cross dying for my sins, taking my place, and on the third day, being raised to life. I confess with my heart and with my mouth, Lord, that you are Lord and Savior of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new heart, Lord, and help me to shift my perspective from this day forward. We love you, God, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray, and the church said, amen, amen. Hey, I love you, young adults. I'm so grateful that you are with us, whether you're watching or you're at one of our campuses. Thank you for joining us. If you made a decision, please, I wanna encourage you, tell someone tonight. Tell one of your directors, one of your coordinators, one of your small group leaders, why? Because we wanna celebrate this with you. There's a party in heaven, but we also wanna help you in your journey to follow Jesus. Young adults, I love you guys, and we'll see you next week.